As it planned its post-war recovery, the Army de l'Air understood that it would need to both purchase a fleet of jet aircraft fit for the 1950s and create an aviation industry that would move the French industrial base ahead at a pace. In 1951, it went to market for a sort of Swiss Army knife of an aeroplane, a large, fast aircraft that could act as a long-range bomber, an all-weather fighter, a close-air support aircraft, and a tactical reconnaissance platform. A hundred aircraft were needed to replace the Douglas invaders that France had been gifted after the war. Usually these kinds of conflicting requirements are a recipe for disaster, but this is not a usual case. The aircraft that emerged from the specification was the Sud Vauteur II, and it was a rare example of an effective compromise. It was also the only French-designed jet combat aircraft to see service that was not made by Dassault. But the Vautour II did not emerge fully baked from Messin Casso in 1951. In fact, it took two tries to design it. Despite this, in most histories of the Vautour II, itself very much a hipster's kind of combat aircraft, only a scant few lines are given over to Vautour I. The typical telling is that it was a direct predecessor of the two, but not much cop itself. The latter is true. The former is in fact quite debatable. This video therefore seeks to shed a little light on the original Vautour, an aircraft that began life in a 1946 competition to design a heavy jet bomber for the Armée de l'Air. Heavy is probably a misnomer as the game had moved on. After all, a B-36 Peacemaker had a maximum takeoff weight of over 400,000 pounds. The French heavy bomber was to be a 45,000 pound aircraft capable of 800 kilometers an hour. Having dismissed the idea of upgrading the four-engine Breguet 482 design before the war, two firms were given the opportunity to respond to the Air Ministry's requirement, SNCAC and SNCASO. At SNCASO, the man given responsible for designing the aircraft was Jean-Charles Parot, their chief engineer. SNCASO, for its sins, was the result of a largely misguided nationalisation and amalgamation of French manufacturers in the run-up to the Second World War. It was established in 1936 by forcing together the southern French firms, including Blériot and Bloch. Then in late March 1941, the Vichy government added the SNCAM block of firms located in the west, including Newport and Breguet, into the construct to make an integrated southwestern aviation firm. This was mainly motivated by the German and Italian occupation, as the merger allowed the design offices of SN Casso to be relocated to the southern city of Cannes, which was in the free zone until November 1942. It must also be said in this that Marcel Bloch was Jewish and anti-Semitism played a part in the decision to dilute his firm's influence. Bloch was sent to Buchenwald in 1944 for repeatedly refusing to help the Germans on their aircraft projects, emerging after the war as Dassault whereas other factories and design teams were forced to produce German aircraft and components, to start with at least the SN Casso team could continue their work on their own designs and innovations. Founded in 1931 by Etienne Romano and nationalised in 1936 as part of SN Case, the Cannes factory was understaffed, but also the only factory available in the area that could be quickly re-established. Although German concerns that the facility was too close to the resistance led to it being closed later in the war, the nucleus of designs at the Cannes plant were instrumental in France's recovery as an aircraft producer after the war. Jean-Charles Parot himself was born in 1907. He graduated from the Toulouse Grand École of Aeronautical Engineering in 1931. Following his military service in the artillery, he got a job as a designer at Amio in 1932, then moved to Bernard. Finally, in 1935, he joined the Bloch Company, staying with it as it was nationalised into SN Casso. After the surrender, he had first been tasked with reconstituting the organisation's Paris design office and then relocated with his team to Cannes. There, he led work on the SO-30 Britann twin-engine transport aircraft, 45 of which would ultimately be built after the war. The SO-30 was the first French aircraft with a pressurised cabin and the first with retractable tricycle landing gear. It also had its wings attached via twin spars and used them for fuel storage. Again, these were first in France. Although those innovations might seem a little bit behind the times, it's important to remember throughout this story that France had essentially missed out on the five most rapid years of advance in aviation on record, 
and there was therefore precious few people in the country with modern aircraft design experience. Jean-Charles Perrault was definitely one of them. When his department relocated back to Paris, he was both SN Casso's chief engineer and the leader of the ambitious bomber development project. Perrault's initial sketches were for a long, cigar-shaped aircraft with a fared-in cockpit and two Rolls-Royce Neen turbojets mounted side-by-side side in the rear fuselage. They were fed by cheek intakes via long intake pipes and exhausted at the rear, with the intakes separated by the fin. Adding the intakes and long ducts to the oval section fuselage created quite a flat, broad fuselage that tapered at the rear. The Neen was a good engine, giving just shy of £5,000 of force, but it was also centrifugal, which made it rather bulky in a side-by-side -side configuration. This propulsion setup was motivated by the designer's desire to keep the aircraft as clean as possible and to eliminate turbulence over the vertical tail. That tail was tall and elegantly curved. Area ruling was apparently used for the first time on a French aircraft, presumably as a result of information retained by the German designers that worked at SN Casso. The SO4000's wings were mid-mounted and they were swept 31 degrees, as was the horizontal tail. The wings were built around two spars, and in production aircraft they would have held fuel. This fact is generally overlooked in analysis of the 4000, with even sober writers pointing to the prototype's small fuel load and thus its restricted combat radius of only 500 miles. But with fuel in the wings, radius would have been a healthier 800 or 850 miles, which is roughly the same as an English electric Canberra. Control surfaces were manual without boost on the prototype, but the intention was for them to be hydraulically powered on the production aircraft. The only exception to this was the flaps, which were hydraulic from the get-go. The landing gear was a tricycle type, but rather than have a single main wheel, there were two complete legs and wheels on each side for a total of four, plus a steerable front wheel. To make things even less orthodox, the main gear retracted outwards into the wing roots, which of course risked weakening the most stressed part of the airframe. Some structural elements were steel, but the majority of the aircraft was made of aluminium and zikral, an alloy of zinc, aluminium and chromium. Welding was used for some parts of the aircraft's skin to reduce drag still further. Most panels were, however, just riveted neatly to the frame, which was built around four longerons. A pilot and navigator sat in a pressurised cockpit right at the front of the aircraft on side-by-side -side ejection seats. Part of the navigator's job was to control the defensive armament, which was a pair of 15mm cannons in barbettes mounted on each of the wingtips. Aiming was radar-directed. Four 1,000-pound bombs were carried in the centre fuselage with the relatively small 1,400-gallon fuel tank above it. An additional four could be carried under wing. In production aircraft, there would have been a panoramic radar for navigation and target finding in the lower part of the nose. The SM4000 was quite a big bird overall. It was nearly 65 feet long and it had a wingspan of 57 feet and 4 inches. It weighed 36,500 pounds empty and 48,500 at full load. Lack of a suitably powerful motor for this aircraft and the rival SN Kank design led the Army de l'Air to conclude in 1947 that neither type would be a viable combat aircraft, but that a great deal could be learned from flying the prototypes. Building that prototype was obviously going to take time for an industry still in the early days of post-war recovery. So while it got underway, SN Casso was directed to build a manned, flyable, scaled-down version of the SO4000 to test the proposed aerodynamics. Their first model was the M1, which was an unpowered glider carried aloft by a mothership and then released. Its wing was swept 34 degrees, but was also mid-mounted with the same combination of ailerons and spoilers as its larger relative. It too featured a teardrop canopy over a pressurised cockpit. Escape, however, was via a ventral hatch through which the pilot's seat could be released in the event of an emergency. That does sound dangerous, but it probably was less so than a 1947-era ejection seat. The landing gear was simply a skid under the fuselage. Low-speed wind tunnel testing took place in May 1947. Then, on April the 6th, 1948, the SOM-1 was carried aloft by one of France's two Heinkel HE274 bombers. Captive flights continued throughout 48 and into 49. It was not until September 1949 that the team felt sufficiently confident to separate the SOM-1 from its mothership for real. So on September the 28th, the bomber climbed to 4,000 metres, and the crew began the process of detaching the glider. First they released the tail, leaving the aircraft attached only by two ball joints at the front, 
each featuring a strain gauge that allowed the forces being exerted on the connector to be monitored. Once the crew was satisfied that everything was within acceptable limits, they gave the pilot a signal. He abruptly put the Heinkel into a dive, breaking the connection and freeing the SOM-1 to glide down for a safe landing. A second flight from 4,000 metres was followed by a third, in which the Heinkel lifted the M1 up to 7,200 metres, a climb that took the heavily loaded aircraft two hours to make. The tenth and final gliding flight of the SOM-1 took place on August 30, 1950. In total, it flew for an hour and 48 minutes at weights up to 5 tonnes, and it exceeded 370 miles an hour. Its flight qualities were satisfactory, despite some roll problems and rather heavy aileron controls at high speeds. Some consideration was given to modifying it with a rocket motor from an ME-163, but that wasn't followed up. The success of tethered test of the SOM-1 led to the construction of the SOM-2, which was powered by a Rolls-Royce Derwent fled by cheek intakes. SOM-2 had proper landing gear, which featured a curious triple-wheel, inline main gear and steerable nose wheel. Flying for the first time on April 9th, 1949, it demonstrated excellent handling. In May, it became the first French-designed jet fighter to exceed 1,000 km an hour in level flight. Having flown for two years, in April 1951, the SOM-2 underwent significant factory modifications, including the installation of elevator servos, an increase in fuel capacity, and the installation of retractable wingtip balancers. The aircraft was also fitted with a more powerful Derwent 8 Plus in an attempt to make it less underpowered. These modifications started weeks after the full-size SO-4000 itself had lumbered into the air for the first time. That moment had been intended to happen a year earlier, but things had not gone to plan. On April 9, 1950, the SO-4000 left the hangar to perform its first ground runs. On April 13, the aircraft began its taxi test with Daniel Restel at the controls. On April 23, Restel was conducting a test run at 200 km an hour when he noticed the aircraft was deviating from its trajectory and entering a curve to the left. Despite his best efforts to rectify the situation, the aircraft rolled sideways and the landing gear failed. The new bomber slid across the taxiway in a shower of sparks. Fortunately, Restell had acted quickly and switched off the engine before the inevitable crash, thus saving himself and the aircraft. But the damage was extensive and repairs took six months to complete. In May 1950, the Air Ministry definitively cancelled the programme, but they allowed development of the prototypes to continue. SN Casso therefore decided to use the enforced downtime to modify the wing spoiler action in the air brake setting and to change the flaps. They also fitted a Heinkel ejection seat for the navigator. Taxiing tests resumed in October 1950. Although improved, the SO4000's taxiing behaviour was best described as unpredictable. The landing gear was very narrow, and presumably because it had been designed by a nationalised enterprise, the aircraft tended to veer to the left. As Rastel attempted to progress to an actual takeoff, he discovered a significant problem. The unassisted ailerons couldn't be moved so that they would deflect sufficiently for takeoff. The engineers therefore altered the pitch of the horizontal tail, and on Valentine's Day 1951, the SO4000 managed a short hop. The scene was therefore set for an official first flight. On March the 15th, Rastel, with a navigator in tow, rolled down the runway. Once again, the SO4000 began an uncommanded roll to the left as it accelerated, but Rastel compensated and succeeded in getting the bulky aircraft up off the deck. The flight was conducted at relatively low speed with the landing gear extended. It lasted only 15 minutes, which was arguably enough. The SO4000 was dangerously unstable in roll, exhibiting significant oscillations in supposedly level flight. Elevator action was too strong, meaning that the aircraft had to be flown very delicately at all times. Deciding that attempting to find out more was tantamount to suicide, Rastel very carefully brought his charge back in and landed. Thus ended the first and the last flight of the SN Casso SO4000. Given that the programme was already terminated and the underpowered aircraft had turned out to be possessed of a range of lethal flaws, there seemed no point in trying to learn anything more from it. Entertainingly, SN Casso seemingly managed to withhold at least some of these facts from the Air Ministry. Before completely giving up, they proposed a version with improved engines and also a reconnaissance version with cameras in the bomb bay. Those ideas went nowhere, 
And in the summer of 1951, the French Air Ministry returned to Essen-Casso with a new specification to replace the invader as a medium bomber. Perrault took his lessons from the SO-4000 and emerged with the SO-4050, better known as the Vauteur II. Although it is also a twin-engined, swept-wing aircraft, as you can see from these drawings, it was almost completely unlike its heavy bomber forebear. The Vautour II probably deserved more success than it got. US and British interference in the export market meant that it was used, albeit quite successfully, only by France and Israel. Dassault would provide its successor in the form of the Mirage IV. Jean-Charles Perrault went on to design several French surface-to-surface missile prototypes, and was involved in the Mirage 3. Then, returning to the civil market, he had a hand in the Corvette business jet, and then the Airbus 300. He retired in 1970, and died aged 87 in 1994. He was a low-key, but quite an important part of the French aviation story. As for the Vautour 2, well, that's another story.